Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 1st, 2014, and my guest is Terry Anderson, Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center and Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's the author of numerous books on environmental issues and is one of the founders of the free market environmentalism movement. Terry, welcome to Econ Talk. My pleasure, Russ. Great to be with you. So you are one of the founders, as I said, of what is called the free market environmentalism. Uh, you wrote a book with that title, co-authored it uh, back in, I think, 1991, and it's uh, being revised and it's going to come out soon. What distinguishes your approach, the free market approach, from other ways of uh, dealing with environmental issues? Yes, you're right, Russ. It was uh, the book, uh, Free Market Environmentalism, was published in 1991. Uh, and uh, the second edition in 2001, the third edition forthcoming in 2015. Uh, I think I could start by by recalling the review of the first uh, edition in which the reviewer said free market environmentalism is an oxymoron and then said the authors, since it's co-authored with Don Leal, the authors are the moron part. And I <laughs> That's think that flattering. actually actually captures the the uh, view of the the idea. And the idea was to find an interface between markets, which we know do a great job of producing everything from shoes to houses, uh, and the environment, which we're demanding more of. Our thinking in the late 1980s was uh, first to question whether government did a good job of producing the environmental goods and services we we demand and second if uh if to to find ways that markets could do it uh better than than government was and so we began asking what are the forces of of markets that are important to the shoe production or house production and how can we harness those for the environment and what are those factors well, the, the obvious one, and it's especially important for the environment, is uh, the existence of well-defined and enforced property rights. When we think about what environmental problems are to most people, they, they don't think of it this way, but they're really property rights problems. You are dumping your gunk into my uh, receptacle, be it the air, the water, my land, and uh, I want some recourse. And if if we have a well functioning legal system that that respects and and defends property rights, your dumping gunk into my receptacle means you have to pay me or cease and desist. And that's been the the uh, cornerstone of free market environmentalism. It, it, let me let me just use a, a, the example that, that I've written the most about, namely water markets, where we have well-defined property rights to water and we have those in in many parts of certainly the western u.s and and increasingly around the world once we have those property rights people can trade water and when that happens people get very aware of what what that water is worth in other uses and compare that to what it's use uh, it's, it is for them as owners Again, a quick story. I I wrote a, a book on on water markets back in the '80s, and and a local farmer called me after it was published and featured in the local Bozeman paper, and he said, "Oh, you don't think we should sell our water for coal slurry, do you?" This was at a time when they were going to use water to take coal to Texas, and I said, "Well, what's your water use you worth in agriculture?" And he said, "Oh, you know, fifty dollars per unit." And I said, "Well, I've heard it's worth two hundred and fifty in coal." And there was sort of dead silence at the other end. And he finally said, "What were those numbers again?" <laughs> uh, if he owned his water and could sell it, he had to consider what the opportunity costs were. As I'm sitting uh, here at Stanford, you're in Montana uh, right now. We were at Stanford earlier this year, but uh, we're we're pretty far apart. And as you probably know, uh, it's not news. Uh, there's always water problems here in California. And right now on the Stanford campus, all the fountains are off. 
uh, to conserve water. It's a lot of visitors come here from all over the world to take pictures here at Stanford and to tour the campus. And uh, those pictures are not going to be as pretty. And walking around is not as nice as it would be otherwise because they've turned off the water. And most people think when they see the little sign that says water is – fountain is off to conserve resources, well, that's a good thing. Uh, what's your perspective? Oh, yeah, I saw the <laughs> uh, dry fountains when I was there this spring on my uh, annual uh, uh, excursion. And, well, there, there, there are two important points, I think. The first is that, that, that we often do these things that are, are uh, pretty superficial. Uh, water being squirted into the air and draining back into a fountain doesn't really use a lot of water, even though it might look as though it does. That water... Uh, often is recycled in the same fountain. Uh, you know, we, we, this exists in Las Vegas where people say, oh, it's in the desert and look at what what they do at the Bellagio or wherever. And, and uh, in, in reality, it's not a lot of water used in that it's it's all recycled. Uh, but, but, a, but a more important point, I think, is that uh, – if the water's really valuable for that picture that's being taken of the Hoover Tower, uh, then uh, there should be a price on it that, that reflects that. And the problem is water's cheaper than dirt in most places, even in a drought situation like the California's user. in. Che cheaper to the user. To the user, yes. Oh, absolutely, to the user. Uh, and yet <laughs> it has alternative values. And it has huge costs to uh, store and deliver. And if we don't, uh, if without markets, the likelihood that we'll get those two uh, sides of the scissors, the demand and supply side, to come together, uh, it'll require just uh, you know turning off fountains, and we'll we'll think we're doing something, but it really won't solve the problem in the long run. But water's a necessity, Terry. Don't you think it's wrong to charge people for it? <laughs> Well, there, I've debated a, a, a woman named Maud Barlow, who now is at the United Nations you know, working on water issues. And Maud thinks uh, that water is a hum basic human right. And there are lots of other people who, who run this line. Uh, and I can imagine seems, that seems we... Seems reasonable. Yes, and I, I, I think it could be something you could make the case that there's a basic human right that the rest of us have a responsible to a responsibility to meet when it comes to some minimal level of drinking water, uh, uh, bathing water, cooking water. Uh, but we don't quite think that water is a human right to fill swimming pools or to water green lawns or to wash. Uh, uh, the Lexus that sits in, in one's driveway. And so it's not a question of can we supply or should we as society supply some basic minimal amount to people, but after that, uh, what should we charge people who want more? And here, uh, to use an economics term uh, you'll be familiar with, uh, some places use increasing block rate structures. And that means... As people consume more, they pay more. So we could make the basic human right free. Uh, but if you get above that amount, then you have to pay more. And, and each time you go up into a new block, you pay more yet. And that also reflects the the, the additional cost of, of, of those extra units. So uh, where, where increasing block structures are used, uh, people do respond to prices. And, and here in California, the, the structure of those prices, to the extent there are prices, a lot of users who get either uh, zero price water or highly subsidized water, correct? The uh, the north and the south here have very different uh, patterns of usage and, and payment, correct? Not, oh, not different absolutely. Payment, but explain the rough outline of that. If you if you look back at the history of of water in the United States and especially true in the Western U.S. Uh, but but true in the East as well, uh, you have agencies like the like the Bureau of Reclamation that have built dams, built delivery systems, and contracted to deliver that water often to agriculture, and that's eighty percent of the use in the West uh, to agriculture at incredibly low prices. And it's put on crops that don't, may not even, uh, won't even come close to covering the real cost of the water. Uh, 
So if you're a farmer and you're you're in a contract with the Bureau of Reclamation to receive water at let's say forty dollars an acre foot, that's that's uh, roughly a football field covered with a foot of water or three hundred and twenty five thousand gallons of water. If you're paying forty dollars for that that acre foot of water, and you're putting it on a crop worth say where it generates sixty dollars in value, you're saying, hey, this is great for me. But if that's costing, and these are real kinds of numbers, $350 an acre foot to deliver, uh, somehow the economics of that can't work. And uh, and that's true throughout, especially the agricultural sector, where, again, as I said, it's 80% of the use, and, and in the municipal sector, where it's another uh, 10% plus. The one place where people probably come closest to paying the full cost is the industrial sector, and it's one of the smaller users. Yeah. Let's go back to the property rights uh, emphasis in, that you mentioned earlier, and we've talked a lot about Ronald Coase on Econ Talk and you know, the, the economics profession in the up until the uh, midpoint of the 20th century uh, looked at issues of externalities, pollution, uh, typically as problems that had to be fixed by uh, top-down regulation. And Coase really opened up the possibility that there was an alternative way to get there. And I see, and I want you to comment on this, I see the free market environmentalism movement with its emphasis on property rights as a way of taking some of Coase's insight, not all of it, but some of it, and making it uh, a legitimate alternative to government regulation. I think it's misunderstood in that people think it means uh, – uh, uh, no government solution. Obviously, typically the advocates for these property rights solutions want government to enforce these property rights and they want to use that role for government rather than a regulatory uh, command and control model that says you can't do this, but you can do this. Rather, give people rights to these precious resources and let people who have the highest value of them use them. Is that a good summary? And, and expand and, and change that if you, if you want to. Well, I don't have many changes to, to make, actually. I thought you summarized it quite well. I'll start by saying that uh, Professor Coase uh, was really the cornerstone of our thinking, even if we weren't explicit in, in saying so in the early years of developing free market environmentalism. I think more and more uh, relying on COAS has, has come to be uh, just the most important part of free market environmentalism. You used a word that that I have tried to expunge from my vocabulary and, and do so at every opportunity with others, and that's that E-word externality. We use it freely in economics, and now many other disciplines use it as if we know what it means. But COAS... I think, and he didn't use the word when he wrote his uh, famous social cost article, uh, he made us aware that that an, to call something an externality requires thinking about who is harming whom. And uh, thought of in that way, I often say Coase was a causal agnostic. That is, he didn't say the cause is the train burning up the wheat. Uh, he, he wanted to know, to know how does the law sort this out? And I think that's a large part of what it, environmental issues are, are about. And the sorting out part is indeed, as you said, the role of government courts, especially the rule of law. How do we know? Does your action harm me or does my existence in, in the face of your action harm you if I tell you to stop? Uh, and uh, – I think all free market environmentalists and good economists understand that there's an extremely important role for government to play in in helping to define rights and enforce rights. Then the question is, what about the tradability of them? And that's the market part. Uh, and, and here, let me use my favorite example of, of how an environmental entrepreneur, someone who is trying to solve environmental problems using markets, sees this whole issue of rights. Here in Montana, they, we have a, uh, an issue regarding the wolves that were reintroduced in 1995 into Yellowstone National Park, exploded in population faster than any biologist ever imagined. They wander outside the park, and once in a while, they kill livestock. This is a classic coast problem. Is the wolf eating the livestock? 
a an externality to the farmer or are the cattle being in harm's way an externality to the wolf lover uh and and my favorite example is a is an environmentalist hank fisher who said i'm not going to debate who has what rights i'm going to just say i'm going to stipulate that the rancher has a right to be predator free i'm going to raise private money and pay the ranchers if a wolf kills livestock done deal market transaction and he has now expanded this to actually paying farmers to move their cattle out of harm's way this is ronald coast <laughs> uh writ large and i think it's a it's a great example of how free market environmentalism takes care of this conflict between wolves and livestock owners yeah and there, there's an example where you, you don't want to pen in uh one of those creatures and whatever way you pen in the other say the cattle it's not always it's it's expensive to do it in a way to make sure a wolf can't get through it so it's yeah, uh, I, you there's know, no easy it, private solution right off uh and then you've got an issue then of how do you how do you make that world a better world and that, that's yeah. that's a beautiful story where does he does he raise, and i assume he raises his money from private individuals or who like wolves uh, uh, private individuals and foundations when he first started he he had a local uh, uh artist paint a stylized uh vision of what wolves would look like with geysers in the background he sold these posters for 30 and and after they did the painting they made them into a poster and he sold the posters for 35 dollars each and he raised a hundred thousand dollars very quickly i have one of the posters uh it was a way for people to say two things one i support you hank fisher in your efforts to to move forward with resolving this conflict and two I kind of have a badge of honor on my wall that I can show to people and say, hey, I'm holier than thou. Uh, <laughs> How's that working for you, Terry? Uh, or maybe that's greener than thou. <laughs> <laughs> or wilder than thou. I mean, it's pretty cool. Uh, well, it's a really interesting example because I was going to ask you later about private national parks, uh, whether national parks should be run federally, but most people are very uncomfortable. I love – I have to say I think the national parks are one of the better things that government does and I really get a tremendous amount of pleasure for many of them. So uh, my kids who know I'm not a big fan of government say, well, do you think the government should run the national parks? And I say, well, it's not the worst thing in the world that they do, but in many ways they run them very badly. They tend to let lots of people in because they charge low prices and the land gets overused, the habitats get overused. And worse, in the early days of Yellowstone, not the early days, but the early part of the 20th century, they got rid of a lot of the wolves because it made it bad. Tourists didn't like uh, – that they were afraid of them. And they also like seeing elk, which are very safe. And as a result, the elk population was out of control in Yellowstone, which meant that there was a huge amount of degradation of grasslands there and, and habitat and uh, especially riparian streamside stuff. And um, I've been fascinated by this reintroduction of wolves, which uh, I don't know much about the consequences of it. So if you can, has it reduced the elk population? I see it's reduced some of the cattle population, but is it, uh, has the elk population changed and is the habit, do you know, and is the habitat within Yellowstone uh, responded accordingly when the uh, elk, which are incredibly destructive um, and, and unnatural at that level because the wolves aren't there, has the habitat responded? Well, I will I'll take a bit of a circuitous route to the final part of your question, but I have to preface it saying you're talking to an elk hunter who now has fewer elk to hunt. So, uh, Life's you tough, know, that, Terry. That, I'm, you got I'm competition. Not a, you got competition. I'm, <laughs> I am not an unbiased observer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to go clear back, though, to your, your uh, point about governments running national parks. And emphasize that if you look at the history of Yellowstone, uh, and I have a paper with P.J. Hill on this, and we're actually revising it for a conference celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Park Service, Yellowstone was really established by railroads. And it was the railroads who saw the value uh, in that if they could bring people to these, these wonderful natural sites, they could make more money in transportation. Uh, the problem for the railroad was they couldn't get private ownership of Yellowstone because the Homestead Acts were in place. 
all you could get was 360 acres at a maximum. And that meant that you couldn't really own the entire uh, area necessary to capture this value. And so the option for the railroads was to get them declared a national park, Yellowstone in particular, but this happened with it, this is true of, of, of uh, Grand Canyon, it's true of Mount Rainier, it's true of Crater Lake, it was true at the state level with Yosemite. So, But to get them declared a national park and then get a monopoly on taking people into the park, feeding them, housing them, and, and the Northern Pacific Railroad was a master at this. So it was really a private park to start with. Ratchet forward in time now and, and and look at how we manage them today, and you've captured it well. They're overcrowded. You you go to Yellowstone or go to Yosemite or during the peak times, and, and it's just a, it is a classic case of, of congestion uh, just making the experience not nearly what, what people think it would be. You take a picture of Old Faithful, but you have a bald head in the foreground. Uh, and so national parks are are operated might even go back to the certain notion of isn't it a isn't it a basic human right to get into a park for a low price i am old enough i get my golden eagle pass i paid for it once it was 20 dollars i get into the yellowstone or any other park for free the rest of my life and yet surely Retired people have more wealth than the average taxpayer. So we could charge people. What about the tourists who come from out of the country? We could charge them more, reduce congestion, and have more revenues. And that's something here at PERC uh, we, we pushed for and, and actually is a now, now is a part of policy. The money they do collect, at least a share, is kept at the parks and, and reinvested. And that kind of makes a bit of a connection between the consumer and the producer. All that said, I, trying to balance these these various demands on the park, and I come back to me being an elk hunter and you being this wolf lover, uh, there there was competition. The, the ranchers really are the ones who pushed for the extermination of the wolves in and all, around parks and all through the West, really. Uh, they, they shot them, trapped them, poisoned them, and, and got to what they thought was the optimal number zero. Time changed, and uh, people like Hank Fisher said, I want more wolves. And to be sure, you are correct. The, the herd in Yellowstone, the northern half of Yellowstone elk herd was over 20,000, and I've, I've hiked and horseback ridden that part of the park a lot. There were no young aspen trees because they were all grazed off. There were no willows on the bran on the banks of stream because they were grazed off. There were no beaver. So the wolves uh, came in, uh, were brought in, and uh, they they did reduce the elk herd. They pushed the elk herd back into the high country. They pushed the elk herd out of the meadows. And it's a very different environment today. Is it better? Well, it's better if you're a wolf lover and not better if you're an elk lover. You can't you almost never see an elk in Yellowstone today. Uh, and so the better is a matter of, I think, of, of how we humans interface with a dynamic environment. And our demands on those environment, on that environment is, is our demands are also dynamic. And the bureaucracy Park One or Environmental Protection Agency One, those bureaucracies have a hard time dealing with that kind of uh, uh, dynamism. And, you know, the result in Yellowstone is I think uh, the meadows look better to me. The beavers are happier. There are a few more dams. Uh, there are a few less elk and a lot more wolves. If now, I were the park czar, I'd reduce the number of wolves a little bit and try and tweak the dial. But I think therein is is – is the is is how to think about this as an environmental problem where should that dial be set given that we're changing all the time what we want as humans and what the environment can supply us yeah so yeah it's really uh i, I can't help but think about macroeconomics and fine-tuning <laughs> <laughs> the Fed adjusting the interest rate by a little bit. We don't really yeah. understand the connection always between the knob <laughs> and the outcome. And I, I've written, drawing on the work of others, that you know, when they got rid of the elves, they got rid of the beaver. And, I mean, when they got rid of the wolves, they got, I said elves. That's the cross. That's a wolf elf. A wolf elf is an elf. <laughs> but uh, when they got rid of the wolves, uh, the unexpected consequence was the beaver got less numerous, which you would not have anticipated, but that was the connection between – 
wolves not trimming the elk herd, the elk herd then having the ability to destroy streamside habitat, which made the beaver's life much more difficult. And I think it, it, there is a, a, an important parallel between the economy as an ecosystem and, and the unintended consequences that are, that are uh, often the, the case when you change that dial. But the point I wanted to clarify – yeah, go ahead. Let me just make, make one quick point on, on, on what you just said. I, I, I think a growing number of ecologists are, are seeing just what you've described not as uh, a, an effort to find the exact point on the dial where we have the balance of nature, uh, which is what some people – uh, still think of as the wolf being a, a way to balance nature, but but I think more and more ecologists are understanding this is a this is a dynamic process. The point you were getting at, yeah, I want, we'll, we'll talk some more about that. I hope, but but the I think one way to think about it is there's a temptation. I fall into this myself to say, well, the wolf naturally belongs in Yellowstone Park at such and such a level, and when I think of such and such a level, I think the level that would exist without human beings. That's the natural, the right level. Neglecting the fact that populations without human beings are not stable. There's not some perfect equilibrium. And often when we say what we, when we're talking about the world without human beings, we mean white human beings. We're neglecting uh, the impact of Native Americans who changed ecology and, and habitat all over the, the West and the United States. But somehow that's, we romanticize that. That kind's okay, but not recent kind. Oh, I think we just have to go back if we're if we're going to be good ecologists and good economists and think about free market environmentalism. We have to do what you just did and go back and think about how humans interacted with the environment for for ages. I mean, you put this in the context of Yosemite in the forthcoming edition of Free Market Environmentalism. We have a a great uh, series of pictures of the Yosemite Valley. And if you look at those pictures in the in the mid 1800s, the early ones taken by Carlton Watkins, uh, there weren't many trees in the valley, and they weren't there because the Indians burned them off. Burning them off made better wildlife habitat, better places to find deer and elk. <laughs> And then we made it into a national park. The trees began to grow. They started to get thick, and people said, but we can't see El Capitan. And so the Park Service came in and cut a few of them down. Now people say, oh, we need old growth. And if you look at the exact same view <laughs> taken from the exact same point, starting with those late uh, mid to late 1800 photos to today, you cannot from that point see any element of El Capitan. <laughs> Uh, and so what's the right one? Should we go back to 1944? Or would you prefer 1921? Uh, and, and I think therein is the, is the difficult uh, problem of uh, we humans face in how we interface with the environment. You and I as economists are you know, quick to draw a diagram on the board talking about the optimal level of pollution based on benefits and costs. But what is that optimal level? <laughs> how is it changing? Uh, to say nothing of how we get there, free market environmentalism is partly about how we get to that optimal level. But uh, but but even even trying to think about uh, what it is is uh, is in the in the in this dynamic kind of viewpoint uh, is is very difficult. So uh, before we leave this area, you're talking about property rights generally and in, in free market environmentalism, I want you to talk about barbed wire because uh, that was an important uh, part of your um, of your research and I'd like to hear you talk about it. Why is barbed wire interesting and important to a free market environmentalist <laughs> and an historian? <laughs> Anyone who's ever uh, seen the uh, Lonesome Dove movie or read the books, uh, the book uh, knows book. about uh, cattlemen coming to Montana driving these herds of of cattle up from Texas, and I always try and imagine. Suppose they they got to the border of Montana and they met Russ Roberts, and Russ said, "Let me tell you boys about the tragedy of the commons." And he <laughs> threw this diagram in the sand, and 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 these cowboys look at Russ Roberts like, "What are you talking about, man?" I, I, suppose they understand your graph, uh, they would say, well, "How can there be a tragedy here? There's there's grass forever, and we've just got a couple thousand head of cattle." Uh, 
And so they move in, and, and this goes on year after year with with uh, Russ Roberts just wringing his hands and frustrated at the inability of people to recognize the problem. Uh, but even without uh, Russ's lectures, people began to to recognize the potential for tragedy of the the tragedy of the commons, and quite quickly formed cattlemen's associations, the kind of thing that uh, Eleanor Ostrom would you know love to talk about, and I've talked about it with her. Is, uh, these are voluntary uh, restrictions are, on the use of resources, not government, right? Government wasn't even a, a close to Montana at the time these were formed. These were these were people saying, "Gee." Uh, our cattle are mixing with one another, interbreeding, and maybe we don't want that. Uh, and if you put all your cattle where I put all mine, there will be a tragedy of the commons. And so even before barbed wire, these cattlemen's associations got together and, and carved up uh, customary grazing territories. And then they said, well, we need to kind of define these and enforce them. And so they defined them by actually writing down, you know, Terry Anderson gets from the big rock up on the ridge, along the ridge to the big tree, down from the tree to the, where the two cricks come together and so on and so forth. And then they I just have to interrupt. I have to interrupt, Terry. It's the first time I think in 430 plus episodes of Econ Talk that the word crick has been used. I just, well, I love I, that. Careful, Keep going. Careful to get the right <laughs> pronunciation in there. Uh, uh, and I'm sitting here in my office looking at a wonderful photograph taken in, in about 1882 of what was called a line camp. And it's a log cabin on a ridge with two cowboys and two horses in the foreground, obviously staged. But a line camp was the place where these cowboys who had to ride the line between customary grazing territories would ride every day and, and shoo them little doggies back to one side or the other. Uh, so even before barbed wire, we had an innovative way of solving the property rights problem. And then barbed wire comes along as a much cheaper and way more effective way of, of defining your rights and enforcing them. And barbed wire, when it came into existence, it actually drove uh, drove a lot of uh, these cowboys uh, into the unemployment world. Uh, they the, there was no longer a need for as many cowboys once once barbed wire exist uh, was invented, and it quickly spread because it was so so cheap. Uh, with barbed wire, you could. Uh, uh, Keep your cattle in various pastures, not overgraze. Uh, you could you could refine your herd. You could have uh, Angus. You could have Hereford. You could uh, get the best bulls so that you had the best calves, and and the list goes on. So barbed wire was just a, a magnificent solution to the to the uh, property rights problem. I think the, there's a wonderful history there, and I, I love studying history. So in writing about it, and P.J. Hill and I have done have done a lot of that with respect to barbed wire. But I think there are some some really important lessons to learn from this as well. And and the lesson is that technology plays a crucial role in defining and enforcing property rights. Let me give you a couple of of more modern examples. Today, we don't have to take a a rectangular survey crew out and try to shoot lines to determine uh, whose property is where. We have something called the GPS. And with 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 global po positioning satellites, we're able to to find points on the earth so refined as to be within inches of 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 exactly where we want them. Uh, we worked with a group uh, from Bolivia trying to resolve an issue of of harvesting trees in the in the cloud forests, uh, and as a result, reducing water supplies to downstream farmers. This environmental group partnered with the farmers, went to the loggers, convinced the loggers they could make more money if they grew, raised bees instead of cutting trees, and the result was magnificent. The the loggers said, "Hey, we want more money." Uh, and then they said, well, why don't we define our property rights to the logging areas more precisely so so we know whether our forests <laughs> that we want to save for our bees uh, are are defendable against outsiders. And so they went up with a GPS and literally marked all the points and got everybody to agree whose property was whose. So here's, a, here's barbed wire <laughs> in the modern yeah, context. Wild. 
incredible. In a in a in a in a pollution kind of context, uh, there there's been some experimentation with tracers, which allow uh, allow the government as an enforcer of property rights to say we know that it's the gunk coming out of Carrie Anderson's smokestack that's falling on Russ Roberts. Uh, laundry to to go back to Ronald Coase and uh, Terry Anderson you have to either pay Russ Roberts for the damage or you have to stop Uh, tracers offer a a really neat new technology for identifying who are the emitters of of of, uh, smoke or or pollutants into the water and uh, who's receiving them and what are the costs and and who should bear those costs so Barbed wire is just a, a, a good way of thinking about the importance of technology, and there are lots of places where it can be used today. Fine, a quick one, last one, whales. We can tag whales, and you, Russ Roberts can own whales, and so can Terry Anderson. We can know at any point in time right where they are. Is that being used in any way to maintain that uh, population? It, it is not at this stage that in any systematic way. Some people are tagging them for scientific purposes and tracking them, but it, it's not really a property rights sort of solution. But but there is one in fisheries. In New Zealand, where they established uh, individual fishing quotas, that is, they said we're overfishing the, the common uh, fish resources, we will assign, we, we the government will establish a quota We'll allocate that quota to the people who fish and a share of the quota, and they can fish it, they can trade it, they can bank it. Uh, But there's always a problem of what if somebody sneaks into the fishery and catches some of the quota? One of the New Zealand fisheries, uh, the, the people involved voluntarily said, let's all put transponders on our boat. It'll send a signal to a satellite. We'll have somebody monitor this, and they'll be able to tell at any point in time whose boats are out there. And if there's a boat out there that shows up on the satellite that isn't sending out a signal, we'll know that boat doesn't belong to our group. We can go out and say, hey, what are you doing here, Terry Anderson? (laughs) You know, I can say I'm just pleasure cruising, but if I've got a hold (laughs) at three in the morning with my hold full of of uh, 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 Orange Ruffy, uh, probably there will be just a friendly little chat, and if it happens again, a sunken boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you mentioned when the book first came out, uh, the, the book you wrote with Donald Leal, Free Market Environmentalism, it, uh, at least one review, I'm sure wasn't the only one, uh, was not positive. Talk about how the response to a market-based or property rights-based approach to the environment how about how that response has changed over time, if at all? So there's still a lot of hostility to it, obviously. Uh, but has it gotten better, in your opinion? Oh, I think it's almost a sea change, really. It's, it's more than just better. If, if, I, if I go from the uh, moron part uh, to the second edition in 2001, uh, comparing the two, the first edition was a bit of a theory, if you will. It wasn't full of equations and graphs that would uh, tickle the hearts of economists, but but it was a theory in the sense that it said, if we had property rights to water, if we had property rights to wildlife, if we had tracers in, in, uh, in the smokestacks, uh, then we could have a property rights as- approach, but there weren't many examples. Well, now it's 2001, we're writing the second edition, and the Hank Fisher story about wolves is is ripe for putting in there. Uh, by then, environmental groups were purchasing water from farmers to leave it in the stream for fish. Uh, we were we were able to find many many examples by 2001 of environmental entrepreneurs at work. And now, to the edition that'll come out next year. Uh, since 2001, coincidentally, uh, we at PERC started running our Enviropreneur Institute, so Environmental Entrepreneur Institute. And uh, the, the Bolivian example I mentioned earlier comes from that institute. We have 200 and I think almost 50 people now who've come through this this sort of crash MBA, I like to call it, and with an eye towards how do we apply this? And the number of of just ripe examples, some of which I've used already, uh, are uh, 
uh, I think, tell just how much more receptive people are. That doesn't mean everybody is. And I, uh, without mentioning names, can can uh, recall going to uh, New York City to visit the heads of two environmental groups to discuss the possibility of of getting rid of grazing on public lands through a market approach by the grazing permits from the from the livestock owners. One of those people said, well, we could do that, but you know, they shouldn't have those rights. And we went back and forth with that discussion for some time and finally agreed that he wasn't going to join the, the team to try and convince uh, government uh, officials to, to allow this kind of transaction. That's that's another story. Governments stand in the way of markets. Uh, but he said, oh, they shouldn't have it. They shouldn't have it. And I finally gave up. If that's your position, then then you're going to have to win the battle in the political arena. I went the next day to another environmental leader uh, who said, hey, let's just get on with it. We can help raise the money. We'll, we'll facilitate these transactions. That environmental leader is, uh, is from the Environmental Defense Fund, and their motto is finding ways that work. And, and uh, as Fred Krupp, the, that person, put it to me, when he started as a lawyer with EDF, their, low, their unwritten motto was sue the bastards, and today it's finding ways that work. Markets are one of those ways that, that, that entrepreneurs, environmental entrepreneurs, see as solving the problems they want to solve. What do you see as the biggest limits to this approach? Well, the biggest limits are the property rights limits, really. I've, I've, every time I speak, and as I have here, you know, I start with land because that one's pretty easy. Barbed wire, uh, GPS. Uh, I go to water. And that one's pretty easy too. It does flow across boundaries and and uh, changes the, the the supply changes from season to season, drought to drought. Uh, but it's it, it, again relatively easy. Then we shift to air emissions, and well, they're a little tougher, but as long as they're within a state, probably not too much of a problem. And and in the forthcoming edition of Free Market Environmentalism, we talk about ways in which the common law dealt with air emissions. But then when air emissions start crossing uh, state boundaries, sulfur emissions in the Midwest causing acid rain in the Northeast, now you're to a problem of how do you, how do you facilitate a, a, a Kosian solution? How do you overcome, as, as he would have clearly pointed out, the transaction costs associated with getting the person in the Midwest to pay for the damages? And, and then now just shift to the, to the, to the mother of them all, uh, global uh, emissions of carbon uh, and other greenhouse gases. Once you once you get into that realm, free market environmentalism doesn't doesn't have a lot of uh, hope for providing a property rights slash market solution. So one criticism of your approach uh, that that you hear sometimes is that you're just a pawn of corporate interests. Your your goal, Terry Anderson and people like you, and that would include people like me. Uh, we want smaller government, and we argue that. That government, uh, when it's smaller, can make room for these these market based solutions, this, these entrepreneurial environmentalists. But that's really just cover for the fact that the corporations just want more freedom to to uh, uh, despoil the the resources that, that are precious to to folks in the name of profit. What's your response to that? You're certainly correct in saying that is a, is a conclusion that many people jump to. Uh, but I come back and, and use a phrase I used earlier, uh, like Coase, I'm a causal agnostic. I, I want to get a property right solution, and, and, and once we have it in place, uh, let the market dictate how things are going to work. So uh, uh, I, I think we need to ask what are the – property rights that people have to to their air and water. These are the real two issues, I think. And most people would say, well, I have a right to clean air, at least enough air that I, you know, I, I won't uh, have asthma, I won't die prematurely of lung disease. And if, if we can show that, that whose gunk it is that's coming into my lungs, uh, and that's going to be mostly from a, a corporation, although today uh, indoor 
emissions in the developing world is probably the biggest source of air emissions that that kills people uh, but if it's if it's a if it's a, a corporation they should have to pay we've documented a case here in montana at the turn of the century when the anaconda copper and mining company ruled the state they owned the legislature they owned the newspapers i mean they they were in charge and yet when their smelter in anaconda montana uh, leached from its tailings piles toxic waste onto neighboring ranch lands. The ranchers said, it's our property, you violated it, cease and desist, and pay up. And the court held with the ranchers, and there are actually today in the courthouse pollution easements, which the Anaconda Company paid for, with the idea that they are acknowledged it was their gunk on the land, and if their gunk trespassed, they would pay the damages. Uh, so this is this is uh, how you hold a corporation, <laughs> corporate America, accountable uh, with property rights and and if if necessary with some some regulations to reduce the transaction costs. I think it's possible to to really get a, a solution that that makes the polluter pay. But one more quick point. I just was uh, looking at because I was. Uh, taped a session with John Stossel just yesterday. Before the Clean Air Act was passed in 1972, Milwaukee was dumping raw sewage into Lake Michigan. Chicago was having to clean up its drinking water from Lake Michigan to get Milwaukee's sewage out. Chicago sued, uh, the state of Illinois really sued Milwaukee and said, you're, you're, you're polluting our water. It's our property right to clean water. You're taking it from us. The court ruled, all the way to the, the Supreme Court, I believe, ruled that Milwaukee was violating Chicago's rights. Along came the Clean Water Act, EPA. EPA set down some, some technological standards, said put these filters on your, on your uh, pipes. Milwaukee did it. Still didn't clean the water up, but Milwaukee's defense was we've done what government said we have to do. It basically obliterated a property rights solution and substituted for it a far less superior uh, regulatory solution. And to this day, Milwaukee dumps raw sewage into Lake Michigan. Yeah, that's uh, that's a lovely story. And I assume uh, <laughs> I, I hope they're still cleaning it up in Chicago before they drink it. <laughs> Uh, I presume so. I, I I have drunk their water. And it, we're we're like alive, me too. But <laughs> I, I'm alive. You're alive. So obviously it's yeah. it's, it's working. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a crucial thing to, to understand too. Is that the environment, as I entitled one of my books, you have to admit it's getting better. How much of it's due to regulation is up for debate. But certainly markets have played a role in, at a minimum in improving technology. I taught a class at the Stanford Business School on environmental entrepreneurship, and I tried to get the students to understand every input that you pay for at the back door that doesn't go out the front door as a saleable product is waste. And so if you're buying electricity or buying coal or buying wood or buying chemicals and they don't get converted into a product you can sell, you have to, you have to get rid of them. You may choose to get rid of them into the air, but the fact that you're not capitalizing on the on the uh, the output side uh, gives you a lot of incentive to reduce your use of coal, wood, chemicals, and so on. Yeah, my my favorite example of that is the aluminum can, which I've probably mentioned before on the program. <laughs> but when I was a boy, uh, and I'm a 1954 birth, but uh, you know, in the, in the 60s, uh, nobody could. Only the strongest of the strong could 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 crush an aluminum can. It was a way of showing off. And today, you can crush it. You can you can you can crush it with your finger, with your little finger. And that's because they've desperately aluminum is expensive. They found ways to use less of it to still keep the can structurally strong enough. And uh, I love this. Just the innovation of the shape of a soda can at the top, the way it tapers a little bit toward the rim is a way to create structural stability and thereby use less aluminum, save money. They're not saying, I hope we can use, uh, save the environment or preserve this precious resource. They're just saying, I want to make higher profit. And of course, they all compete. And as a result, price tends to be, uh, they don't get to capture the profit, but the effort to do so means uh, the world's a better place. Yeah. And, and that's a part of free market environmentalism. 
Yeah, I hear, hear. So you recently wrote a piece with Daniel Botkin, who was uh, a guest on Econ Talk a, a while ago. But the piece was recently in the Wall Street Journal on wildfires, which is something I'm interested in. Uh, talk about what you argued in that piece. Uh, it's summertime. There tends to be uh, the forests are dry. And out here in the West especially, you get, you get a, a, a wildfire problem. So talk about forest fires and wildfires and uh, what you think we do wrong. Yeah. Well, I've, I've come to be great friends with Dan Botkin. He's a, a wonderful ecologist, and he's he's really changed my entire view. He really had a huge impact on the on this this edition of free market environmentalism that's uh, in press. Uh, and he did because in in a book uh, entitled Discordant Harmonies, Dan uh, explained and, and opened great my book. eyes. Great book. It is a great book, and 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 it's it's it you know I don't think it's read by ecologists, but it, <laughs> I wish more would. Uh, in in that he he used the wonderful phrase that some of the people listening who are young might not understand, but he said the environment is not a Kodachrome still life; it's a moving picture show. And when when I read that that phrase, I I was just like. I've been thinking about this wrong all along. I, I was a balance of nature guy, you know, just back to our dials, you know, tweak the dial, twist it here and so on. And or take once, my hand off the dial because then it'll all just go back to its perfect yeah, natural yeah, state, yeah, yeah. which, yeah, will, which yeah. will persist forever, a Garden of Eden. And once I realized that from from Dan's writing that that was just the not the right way to look at it, I – uh, and, and I should should note another great uh, line that Dan has in some of his writings. He says, "If you ask the average ecologist, is the is the environment dynamic?" They'll say yes. And then if you ask them, "Well, what policy would they put in place?" It's a static, you know, balance of nature kind of policy. So I learned learned all that from Dan, and 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 we. He visits here at Perk uh, often, and and so he and I were talking about, well, we ought to write this up in some way to capture how how his ideas interface with free market environmentalism, and that's what led to the Wall Street Journal piece. and And forest fires are are just a, a great example of of the Kodachrome moment. We look out, and I can see it right out my window. We look out at these green forested mountains, and we say, "Keep it that way. That's what I like." It's not even a balance of nature now because it was, you know, it was always burning from lightning or, or Native Americans. But we take that Kodachrome picture and we say, keep it that way. And and the result is we we don't manage the forests even in a in in, in a, a dynamic kind of context. And so here in the West, we have this huge buildup of fuels. We've hardly cut any trees on the national forests since the the spotted owl debacle. I think uh, the the number of trees cut on forests is is about about ten percent of what it was in the in the late nineties when the spotted owl was a big debate. Uh, and so these forests, and unfortunately some of them are on national forests right behind my house, are tinder boxes waiting to go up. And so. Here in Montana this summer, we've had a lot of rain and, and snowpack, so we're not worried at all. But California, Washington, <laughs> Oregon, they're burning up. And and the point Dan and I tried to make was that we need to find ways to to create dynamic policies uh, to to uh, 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 that are compatible with the dynamic environment, and that means uh, if you if you aren't going to have Native Americans burning the forests. Then you need to get in there with chainsaws and and cut or thin the forest. But isn't isn't the uh, problem also that when there is a fire, we try to put it out as soon as possible? Oh, isn't and that so is put, equally important? As I mean, I, it seems to me, oh, we shouldn't necessarily be be logging here and there and trying to figure out what the right way to thin it is. We ought to. The real challenge seems to me is, is how much you should let it burn. But yeah, but they go they go hand in hand. I, I think in that if you if you don't do the the logging then the when the forest does build up the the old growth trees that that uh, are dying when it does catch fire it's going to be a big fire and coupled with that of course the the fact that today a lot of us myself included live on that as it's called urban wildland interface uh and living there we say well don't let my forest burn because that means my house burn and so we spend 
billions of dollars on this every year. Uh, and and it's it's that massive attack that that has allowed this buildup because for the most part fires don't get too big because we get to them. We had a little one here here near Bozeman last week. It was 0.6 acres. They dropped eight smoke jumpers in. They had five fire trucks there. They, you know, that was not going anywhere. Uh, uh, so yeah, it, it's uh, it, it, the question is how do you create a, a, a more dynamic management system. And I think the answer, no surprise to you, is we need more private ownership of these forests. I'll give you just a, my favorite example. The Flathead Indian Reservation in northwestern Montana is home of the Salish Kootenai Confederated Tribes. They have a forest that butts right up against national forest. If you compare the two, their forests earn $2 for every dollar they spend, the Indian forests. The federal government just about breaks even, and that's really unusual. So, you know, give, give the federal government some credit. They did make it there. But the, the flathead forests have a better age distribution of trees, a better species distribution of trees, better water quality, better wildlife habitat, better everything – because they truly try to manage it in a way that reflects their dynamic needs and demands and the dynamic nature of the forest they manage. It's on a large enough scale they can really do something. I think it's those kind of more localized uh, – state governments are, are much the same – more localized and, if, if possible, private solutions to forest management that, that really will be the, the, the way to deal with fire issues. All that said, I don't think uh, in my lifetime we're going to see much privatization of national forests, but we should we should strive towards I think ways of localizing the the management to take account of dynamic changes. Do the national what purpose do the national forests serve? Obviously, there's a great deal of recreation that's enjoyed within them, that, but they're different from national parks. Their people are allowed sometimes to to log there to use the resources there. Uh, what would be, if, if you had your druthers, what would be a, a good solution? And I just want to say that when, when we, you know, I want to come back for a second to our national park discussion. People say, well, would, would you want Disneyland, what, would you want Walt Disney to run Yosemite? And my thought is, well, they kind of do right now because as we talked about before, it's just it's the, gov the government runs it the way I think a lot of people think Disney would run it. It's an amusement park. It happens to be a natural amusement park, but they, they let a lot more people in, I think, than Disney would if Disney ran it. But this, the Sierra Club could run it. Doesn't have to be run by a for-profit corporation. It could be run in a lot of different and and creative ways. And the real fundamental question is: Is the governance structure of the federal government responding to incentives in a useful way or not so useful way relative to a different steward of that land, whether it was a profit-making organization or or, or a nonprofit? So, what what do you see for the national forests, which try to balance all these interests? And I suspect don't doesn't, they don't do it very well. Well, the, 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 your last point about balancing all these interests is key, both the national forests and national parks. The, the, the fact of the matter is these agencies are charged with managing multiple use. Uh, the Forest Service signs used to say, I don't know if they still do, but used to say the, the land of many uses. <laughs> and that's true. They are the land of many uses. I want to hunt on them. You want to hike on them. Somebody else wants to snowmobile. Somebody else wants wants to ride horses. Uh, and somebody else says, wait, that's my watershed. And, you know, the list just goes on and on. And the the problem in the political arena is is trying to somehow manage across these multiple uses uh, in a way that – that uh, doesn't simply result in a, a in, in the lands being a political football. They well, are let, a political football yeah, well, today. Let me, let me caricature it though. When I look at the government solution, I, I always think uh, it tends to to enable and listen to the most powerful. Uh, a lot of people would say, "Well, the free market approach just uh, listens to the richest," and that's uh, that's not good either. Well, I think I think the powerful and the rich are often one and the same. And in the political arena, what's happened with forest, national forest management is it is the powerful and the rich. Uh, if, if management of forests, as as Jack Ward as opposed, Thomas, as opposed to the people, which is what we like to think they do. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Jack Ward Thomas was chief of the Forest Service in the Clinton administration and a good friend of mine. He he describes the management as as a giant Gordian knot. <laughs> and he said, you know, we had people who knew what to do. We had people who knew how to fight fires, where to fight fires, when to fight fires, when to cut trees, and the list goes on. But he said, we couldn't do any of it because every time we tried anything, we were tied up in court. And the court battles are generally battles led by environmental groups who who have this balance of nature, pristine environment, keep your hands off the dial uh, uh, perspective of, of forest management. And the result is uh, there's no management and <laughs> there is no such thing as no management. There never has been. Uh, and when you have uh, this Gordian knot, uh, the only the only result can be uh, a conflict because there are other groups that then are trying to fight back from this. We care in Bozeman about our watershed. The land behind my house is likely to burn. It's in the Bozeman watershed, and yet uh, the trees that have been marked for cutting for 10 years still stand because every time they start a chainsaw, another lawsuit erupts. So it's conflict, conflict, conflict. I call it multiple conflicts over multiple uses. So let's we're out of t- we're out of time. Talk. Let's conclude with the following. You, you talked about the progress that we've made over the last, um, say, twenty years in this in this area, moving toward more private property solutions and less top down. But when you look another perspective, the glass is still pretty uh, pretty empty, uh, half empty at least. Uh, the government's role in the environment still remains substantial. Are you optimistic about? the potential for your approach in at least in many areas, not if not all, but many areas, to to really change government's role to be more of an enforcer of rights, to get out of the way when possible and less top down. I wish I could say I'm I'm uh, wildly optimistic and as soon as everybody reads the uh, the next edition of my book or Gary Leibcap and I have a book, a more academic book called Environmental Markets, a Property Rights Approach, just published by Cambridge University Press. I'd like to say that when people see the light that, you know, this will all change. Uh, that said, I, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the, the young people that come through, say, our Environmental Entrepreneur Institute, uh, the young people I taught at Stanford, the young people that that I encounter when I give speeches who say, wow, this is a way that works. And I think the optimism will be, uh, my optimism is at the, at the more local level where people who really do want to clean up that creek in the backyard or, or, or truly save some habitat for the green-breasted yellow-billed warbler, uh, that's where I think uh, there's, there's room for optimism. Are we going to change EPA? Are we going to change the National Forest Service? Probably only at the margin by tweaking it here and there. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to give up that fight either. My guest today has been Terry Anderson. Terry, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. And thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.